Amen. The title of the the, the sermon this morning is Stand Firm Against Sexual Liberation. And we are uh, concluding our sermon series called Stand Firm this morning. And uh, it's been a good sermon series. This is week five. Um, In a couple of weeks, not next week, but the week after when I come back, we're going to start a a study through 2 Peter, which will be a lot of fun. I hope you're here for that. Uh, But this sermon series has been all about encouraging you to stand firm because it's so easy to fall away. It's so easy to backslide. It's so easy to compromise on the gospel, to compromise uh, God's standard of morality for your life. It's so easy to do that. And we find Christians and even whole denominations doing that all the time and students doing that. Uh, I read a statistic this week. I think it was 75% of students now um, who are raised in church, whenever they go to college, they drop out of church, 75%, and then only 35% ever come back. And so most students who, who are growing up in the church today, even though they have Christian parents, being raised in Christian homes, being raised, going to church, they're leaving the church. They're falling away. They're not standing firm. And so at our church, I want you to stand firm. I want you to stand firm in every season of your life. I want you to stand firm by, by staying active in church, by serving the Lord, no matter what season of life you're in, by um, keep pursuing holiness and growing spiritual growth in your life, uh, and, and just stand firm on sound doctrine, not compromising the faith and, and getting into liberal theology. Um, so, so I want to encourage you to stand firm. And this morning, we're going to be talking about uh, a very, very important topic. Most of you would agree that our country has experienced a major rapid shift when it comes to sexual morality. Since the founding of our nation, our country has pretty much been dominated by the Judeo-Christian worldview and and, and sexual ethic and just morality as a whole. That's just about everybody agreed on a certain level with the Judeo-Christian worldview. We all believe that there is a God who created mankind in his image and that this God informs our sexual ethics. We don't make this stuff up on our own. God tells us how we're supposed to live, and God will one day hold us accountable for our actions. Just about everybody in America believed that until very, very recently. Now, in 2003, the Supreme Court decided that homosexuality was a constitutional right. Before that, many states had laws, anti-sodomy laws, laws against homosexual behavior, and, but the Supreme Court decided in 2003, even though it's not in the Constitution, you won't find the word homosexuality anywhere in there, but they decided that you have a constitutional right to commit that sin. And then in 2012, the Democratic Party declared that same-sex marriage should be a constitutional right, and they made that part of their official platform. That was in 2012. And then in 2015, the Supreme Court decided that same-sex marriage was a constitutional right and that any state laws that were prohibiting or restricting same-sex marriage were unconstitutional. And so we've come a long way in a very short time. Today, our country pretty much as a whole has decided that homosexuality is moral, it's good, it's natural, it's healthy, it's right up there with heterosexuality. The things that we used to think were bad, we now think are good in our country. The things that we used to think are good, we actually now think are bad in our country. And so how did we get to this place in such a short amount of time? I wanted to give you just a little bit of background as to why we are in such a mess in our country right now. The first person I want to introduce you to is there's two men I want to introduce you to. First is Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich. And he lived during the late 1800s and the early 20th century, the early 1900s. He was a student, an Austrian student, actually, of Sigmund Freud, the psychoanalyst. Wilhelm Reich, I would say, was a crazy man, but a lot of people thought he was very smart, and he taught the idea of sexual repression. You might want to write that down. It's very, 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 very dominant even today, the idea of sexual repression. And the idea that he taught was that To deny one's sexual urges and instincts and appetites would lead to mental illness. And that the key to mental and physical health and even societal health 
is to reject all traditional and religious moral claims and to gratify all of your sexual urges. Promiscuity, premarital sex, swinging, homosexuality, bisexuality, pornography, masturbation, whatever floats your boat. If you really want to be a healthy, happy individual, forget about all that morality and all that stuff that was pushed on you, those traditional values, those religious values, and just, just go with your sexual urges. He also wanted to see people demand new sexual rights from their governments. Sexual rights such as the right to contraception, the right to abortion, the right to homosexuality, and even the right to have an easy divorce. He also wanted to see the overthrow of capitalism. And this is kind of interesting. He was a, a committed socialist, but maybe not for the reason that you might think. He believed, in, and this is, this is something that still some people believe, a lot of people believe this, but he believed that the capitalist system encourages those traditional Judeo-Christian ethics and virtues, such as self-control, responsibility, traditional family values, monogamy, sexual purity. In other words, he saw that in order, to, in order for an individual to flourish in a capitalist society, that a person needed to have those traditional Christian virtues. In a capitalist society, if you're immoral, if you do illegal things, if you're irresponsibility, you don't do very well. But if you treat people right, if you're honest, if you're hardworking, if you're virtuous, if you take care of your family, if you take care of your marriage, if you take care of your parents, things go well for you. You seem to thrive. He saw this, and so he said that he wanted to get rid of capitalism and that he wanted to see our country and really the world go into socialism because once the government pro provided people, handed out to people all of their basic needs, such as housing, food, health care, their income, then people will be freed from financial concerns. And so they wouldn't have to be committed to these traditional ethics and morals. And then they would just be free to pursue their sexual urges without consequence, without the traditional consequences in a capitalist society. And so that's Wilhelm Reich. Keep him in mind. That was in the early, early 20th century. The other man I wanted to introduce to you is a name a man by the name of Jean-Paul Sartre. Jean-Paul Sartre. And he was a French philosopher who was highly influential in the middle of the 20th century, in the 1950s, in, in, uh, in the 1940s. And his philosophy was known, and this is very, very important. I want you to write this down. It was known as existentialism. Just spell it the best you can. Existentialism. And the reason why I want you to write that down is because our country is dominated today by the philosophy of existentialism. That's what dominates our country. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about as I explain this. You'll see, yeah, I see that everywhere. I see it in all the movies. I see it on TV. I see it coming from all the, the talk show hosts. I see it from the media. You'll notice this. Existentialism means this. It means that existence precedes essence. Existence precedes essence. Now think of your essence as your purpose, your meaning, your values, your morality. That's your essence, okay? And what Sartre taught was that in the universe, there's no objective morality. There is no meaning. There is no purpose because everything's just a chance. We're all just here because of evolution, by chance. There's no God, and therefore, there's no, no objective morality. There's no objective meaning to life. You have no purpose. You have no objective meaning. There's no such thing as morality and values, all that stuff. It, it, there's no such thing as all that. Really, there is no meaning to life. There's no meaning in the universe. But that doesn't mean that you can't live a life of meaning. If you want to live a life of meaning, you can. All you have to do is define your own purpose, define your own meaning, define your own values, define your own morality. And then if you live by your own code authentically, then you can live a life of meaning. The only thing that determines whether or not your choices are bad, according to existentialism, good or bad, is whether or not you live authentically. And that is, the only thing that's really bad, according to existentialism, is whenever you allow others to determine or define 
your meaning in life, your purpose in life, your morals and your values. If you let other people, religion, your preacher, your parents, a philosopher, politician, if you let somebody else determine and lead you to choose certain values and morals and a meaning and a purpose for your life, then you're exhibiting what Sartre would call bad faith. And the key is to live with good faith, and that is realize the absurdity of life. And that word absurd is key in existentialism. He taught that life is absurd, that there is no meaning to life, objective meaning. However, man feels, feels this deep, deep need for meaning. And he called that the absurdity of life. There is no meaning, but we all want to have meaning. And so he said the key to living a happy life is to embrace the absurdity of life. Realize there is no objective meaning, but I can have meaning by just writing my own code, writing my own book. I'm going to make up my own identity. I'm going to choose who I want to be. I'm going to make up my own morals, my own values. I'm not going to let anybody influence me. I'm not going to rely upon tradition, uh, philosophy. I'm not going to rely upon books, anybody. I'm going to make up my own meaning and morals and values, and then I'm going to live a meaningful life. Does that sound familiar? That philosophy dominates our country today. Now, here's the thing. These two ideas, the ideas of Wilhelm Reich, the idea of sexual repression, that the key to mental and physical health is to throw off all traditional sexual morals, and gratify any and all of your sexual appetites. And then the ideas of Jean-Paul Sartre, the idea of existentialism, that there is no objective universal morals and values that you must determine and define all of that for yourself. These two ideas were embraced by the intellectuals in America. And then they were fed to the students of the 1960s. And these students and these professors are what led the sexual revolution in the 1960s, which is still what we're experiencing today. The revolution is still happening. We're not just feeling the effects of it. It's still going on. It started in the 1960s, and it all goes back, really, to these two men and their teachings. So where are we today in America? The prevailing mindset today in America is that as long as there is consent between two people, and as long as you don't judge others, then you can pretty much feel, do what you feel like doing. Your deviant sexual behavior, in other words, your very abnormal sexual behavior, is not actually sinful. The only sin really is condemning and judging others. There's really no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as right and wrong objectively. Each person gets to define what is right or wrong for themselves. You be you. Go with the flow. Whatever floats your boat, different strokes for different folks, follow your heart, don't judge, and don't listen to others. Don't let others tell you what is right or wrong, what you should or shouldn't do. That's for you to decide. You only have one life. Do what makes you happy. Do what brings meaning and purpose to you. And so today in America, anything goes. Who am I to judge? Everything is okay. Sex is not a matter of morality, it's a matter of preference. It's a matter of taste. Pornography, promiscuity, premarital sex, nothing wrong with those things. Homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, cross-dressing, sure, why not? Polygamy, which means having multiple wives. Polyandry, which means having multiple husbands. Polyamory, which means having multiple spouses, both men and women. Open marriages, swinging, sure, there's nothing wrong with those things. You be you, love is love, whatever floats your boat, follow your heart. And so in our society, while most people, and you'll agree to this, most people with their actions still follow the traditional Judeo-Christian ethic with their actions, but with their minds, they would say that there is no objective morality who am I to judge if somebody else wants to choose a non-traditional path and that there's really no such thing as sexual morals, it's just preferences? Now, you might be thinking, what's the big deal? So what? We live in a free country. Let people do what they want to do. Live and let live. Well, here's one of the problems. The sexual revolution has an agenda, and the agenda is not just to have the freedom to do what they want to do. 
They actually want everyone to affirm their choices. They don't want anybody to condemn or to criticize their choices and their lifestyle. They want their ideas taught in the schools and in the universities and in the churches. They want their ideas to be completely accepted. Anyone who does not join the sexual revolution, they want them to be punished. The state of Colorado said, if you don't want to bake a cake for our same-sex wedding, then we're going to sue you and shut down your business. The state of Massachusetts said, if you don't want to let same-sex couples adopt children, then we're going to shut down your orphanage. The state of Atlanta said, if you believe that homosexuality is a sin, then we're not going to let you serve uh, for the government in Georgia or for the government in the city of Atlanta. New York City said, if you refuse to use somebody's preferred gender pronouns, then you're going to be fined $250,000. The state of Kentucky told one of their clerks of court, if you refused to sign same-sex marriage licenses, we're going to put you in jail. You see, the sexual revolution doesn't just want to live and let live. They don't just want freedom. They want coercion. They want to force everyone in our country to get on board with the sexual revolution. As a result of this pressure, many, many Christians are caving. Many Christians are saying, fine, fine. You seem to be more passionate about your beliefs than I am about mine, so I'll just compromise and so we even have entire denominations who are rewriting their statement of beliefs. Denominations now that are performing same-sex marriages, same-sex weddings, and who are allowing homosexual clergy and even transgender clergy, and, and who are allowing homosexual, active homosexual church members to join the church. And so it, it's, a, it's a very important time for us as a church to be talking about what we need to do to stand firm because the pressure is strong. It's strong on your kids and it's strong on all of us. And so this morning, I want to encourage you with the words of Jesus. Matthew 19, we're going to look at a few verses. Matthew 19, verses 3 through 6. Jesus was asked about the topic of divorce and marriage. But in his answer, Jesus talked a lot, taught a lot about sexual morality as a whole. And so let's pick up in verse 3, Matthew 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees approached him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? And so here you can see the, the context is divorce and marriage. But notice Jesus' words. They address a whole host of topics about marriage and sexuality and gender. He says this in verse 4, haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. And he also said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So let me point out six biblical truths about sexual morality from this passage. Six biblical truths about sexual morality. Number one, the Bible is our authority for sexual morality. The Bible is our authority for sexual morality. Now, how did Jesus answer their question? They said, Jesus, what about divorce? And Jesus answered by, by saying this in verse 4. Haven't you read? Haven't you read? Jesus pointed them to the Scriptures. The Bible was his authority, and he was saying the Bible needs to be your authority. Where do we get our definition for marriage? We get it from the Bible. Where do we learn about the ethics of divorce? We, we get it from the Bible. Where do we learn about gender? We get it from the Bible. Where do we learn about sexual ethics? We go to the Bible. That's where we learn. That's our authority for sexual morality. The Bible gives us all of the essential information that we need to make moral decisions about marriage and sex and gender. It tells us what's right, what's wrong, what's good and bad, what's virtuous, what's vicious, and how to flourish, and how to be happy. Now, here's what we don't do to figure out what's right and wrong, and what's moral, and what's not moral when it comes to sex. The first thing we don't do is we don't determine morality by our feelings. We don't determine morality by how we feel. You don't say, you know, I feel like cheating on my spouse. That must be the right thing to do, because I feel it. No. <laughs> I feel like having sex before marriage. 
that must be the right thing for me to do. No. I feel like punching someone in the face. That must be the right thing to do. I feel like killing myself. That must be the right thing to do. You see, we don't determine morality by how we feel. Our feelings can be very, very deceitful, and many times they are dead wrong. Feelings do not determine morality. The Bible does. We also know that morality is not relative to the individual. It's not relative to the individual. In other words, lying is not just wrong for some people. Lying is wrong for everybody. Stealing, murder, they aren't just wrong for some people in some, t- in some parts of the world, in some periods of history. They're wrong for everybody. Uh, slavery, rape, these things aren't just wrong for some people. They're wrong for everybody. Morality is not relative to the individual. It is objective. It is universal. We also don't determine morality with reason alone. In other words, you can't just determine morality without the Bible, and I'll tell you why. We tend to think we're smarter than we are. (laughs) But here's the problem with trying to determine morality by just using your mind and just trying to think logically. A lot of times what's logical, what seems reasonable, is not what's moral. For example, if somebody hurts you, it may seem very logical and reasonable to get back at them. But the Bible tells us that's wrong. If your spouse is not meeting your needs and if you're miserable in your marriage, it may seem very reasonable and very logical just to call it quits on your marriage, especially if there's somebody at the office that you're really attracted to. But the Bible says that's wrong. It's important to use reason whenever you're making moral decisions. It's important to use your mind and to think, to think deeply. But notice that your reason is not sufficient for making moral decisions. You need revelation. You need God's word. We also don't determine morality through opinion, through majority vote, through popular opinion, through what, you know, what's popular in society today. There was a time when the majority of the people in our country thought slavery was a good idea. That didn't mean it was right or that it was moral. There was a time whenever the majority of Germans voted for Hitler. That doesn't mean that that was moral, that Hitler was good. And so we don't determine morality by taking a poll or by looking at what the majority of people think. The majority is often wrong. We also cannot determine morality by simply looking at the law, that is, the law of the land. The law does not determine what's right or wrong. To be honest, a law can either be just or unjust. In fact, that's the way that Martin Luther King Jr. led our nation to condemn discrimination because he said there were many laws in the land at the time, yes, but if a law is unjust, then it's no law at all. And so it's very important to understand that the law is not king. God is. Whenever the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage was constitutional, a constitutional right, there was a young woman who asked me, she said, so now are you going to start performing same-sex weddings? And I said, of course not. She said, why not? It's the law. In other words, to her, the law is what determined right or wrong. And I guess she hadn't thought it all the way through that many times the law can be very, very wrong. You know, in China, it's against the law for a couple to have more than two children. And that's just recently changed. It was against the law for them to have more than one child. That's an unjust law. That law is immoral. And so the law is not always right. In order to get down to what is right and what is wrong, we need the Bible. We need God. God tells us what's right and what's wrong. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, All Scripture, that's the Bible, all Scripture is inspired. That means God wrote, God is the author. The Bible has uh, over 40 different writers, but one author. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so notice the Bible's four uses. Number one, teaching. The Bible tells us what to believe. And then number two, rebuking. The Bible tells us what not to believe. And then number three, correcting. The Bible teaches us how we shouldn't behave. 
And then number four, training in righteousness. The Bible teaches us how we should behave. The Bible teaches us morality. Number two, the second truth about sexual morality is that God created people to glorify him. God created people to glorify him. If you'll go back to verse four there in Matthew 19, Jesus said, haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning, Jesus took them back on issues of morality. He took them back to the beginning, to creation. He said, God created them in the beginning. And Jesus was quoting from Genesis 1.27, and he was just quoting a part of it. But Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And so this verse teaches us two very important truths. Number one, people are created by God. You're not an accident. You're not just an animal. You're not a product of evolution. God created you. And if God created you, then that means you have a purpose. That means that you actually have a purpose that precedes your existence. And so while existentialism says existence precedes essence, the Bible says essence precedes existence, that God already had a plan for you, already had meaning for you, already had morals and values defined for you before you ever came out of your mother's womb. The Bible says Essence, meaning, precedes existence. God has a purpose for you. You don't get to make up your own purpose. You don't get to make up your own meaning. You don't get to define yourself. Uh, You don't get to define your values and your morals. You don't get to make up your own rules. All of that has been defined for you before you were even born. And that means since God created you and he created you for a purpose, then if you want to know the best way to live and the best way to do sexual morality, then you go to God, your creator. Uh, another truth found in that verse, Genesis 127, is that God made people in his image, in his image. And that's so important for morality. To be created in God's image means this. An image is simply a picture. It's a reflection of something. And so in some important way, we were created to be a reflection of God, an image, a picture of God, a portrait, an icon of God walking around in some important way. In what way? Well, we're not gods. We are are the creation. He's the creator. We're not gods. How are we created to reflect God's image? Well, God is a moral being. God is good and loving and holy and righteous and just and faithful and truthful. And so God created us to reflect his moral nature. And that tells us our purpose in life. The reason we were created was to, as image bearers, to bear the image, the moral image of our creator. We're to walk around being pictures and portraits of what God is like morally. That's our purpose in life. And if you want a happy life, then you find out who God is and what he's like, and you reflect his image. That's what you were created to do. And so if you want to be happy and to flourish, then you live for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. And that tells us a lot about, about our sexual morality. If you want the best sexual morality, you find out what God wants you to do, how he wants you to live, and you live according to that. Number three, a third truth is that there are only two genders, male and female. There are only two genders, male and female. Go back to verse four. Jesus said, haven't you read? that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female. Several important things are pointed out here about gender. First of all, Jesus said there's only two genders. There are not 30 genders. There are not an infinite number of genders. There's only two, and they're male and female. And it's not because there are two people. All through Scripture, as more and more people populate the earth, there are still only two genders, male and female. As well, God gave Adam and Eve their gender. He assigned it to them. God didn't give Adam and Eve the job of figuring out their own gender. He did not give them the freedom to define their own gender. God gave gave it to them. He created them as either male or female. Your gender is assigned to you by God. Third, their gender coincided with their biological sex. Adam was a man because he had male parts. And Eve was a woman because she had female parts. 
In Genesis 4.1, it says the man was intimate with his wife, Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. Eve was a woman because she had the ability to conceive and give birth. She could get pregnant. Adam was a man because he fit with Eve. He complimented her. And so biology coincides with gender. They matter. They go together. Now, what's the lesson? There's only two genders, male and female, the Bible teaches. Your gender is given to you by God. You don't get to decide. You don't get to change. Your gender, third, coincides with your biological sex. You don't have to wonder what it is. You don't have to figure it out. You don't get to figure it out. You don't get to define it. If you have male parts, you're male. If you have female parts, you're female. Now, what if a boy says, I don't feel like a boy, I feel like a girl? My first response is, how do you know? What is a boy supposed to feel like? What is a girl supposed to feel like? And remember that our feelings don't determine morality. God does. Being a boy or a girl is not a feeling. It's a biological, anatomical, inescapable fact. What if someone wants to change their gender? What if a boy wants to be a girl? What if a girl wants to be a boy? Well, first of all, God chooses your gender. Remember, God assigns it to you. You don't get to decide. And God also made your gender to be a permanent part of you. And we know this even from science because you can act like a girl if you're a boy. You can act like a girl. You can dress up like a girl. You can take hormones to make you look more like a girl. You can have surgeries to make you look more like a girl. But in the end, you'll always be a boy. You'll always be a man, no matter what. Your chromosomes will always be XY, and a girl's will always be XX. All right, here's a fourth truth about sexual morality. Marriage is the union of a man and a woman. Marriage is the union of a man and a woman. Verses 4 through 5, Jesus said, Haven't you read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? And he also said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And so God's plan for marriage is found all throughout this passage. He says, male and female, man and wife, father and mother. He doesn't say male and male, female and female, or man and man, or wife and wife. He doesn't say father and father, or mother and mother. It's always the two genders, male and female, man and wife, father and mother. And so marriage is the union of a man and a woman for a lifetime. One man and one woman for a lifetime. The Bible is absolutely clear about marriage, that same-sex marriage is a sin. It says in Genesis here that God made them male and female. And uh, it says it in the words of Jesus in Matthew 19. Jesus repeated it. Nowhere in the Bible do we find a same-sex marriage or do we find the Bible condoning it or accepting it. All throughout Scripture as well, the Bible condemns homosexual behavior. So there's no way the Bible is going to condemn homosexual behavior, but then allow homosexual marriage. Should same-sex marriage be legal? Should it be legal? You say, well, it's the law of the land. It can definitely be reversed. It can definitely be reversed, and it needs to be. Here's the problem with same-sex marriage, and here's why I think it should, should not be legal. One of the reasons. The right to same-sex marriage becomes the obligation to participate in same-sex marriage. Whenever you give these people the right to get married, suddenly it becomes everybody else's obligation to affirm it, to participate in it, to condone it, to applaud it, to teach it as moral and as normative. And we've seen that with all of the different lawsuits. Tons of lawsuits have come out with the passage of same-sex marriage against people of faith, not just Christians, but anybody who believes, anybody who dissents from the sexual revolution. We've seen government employees are being fired. Christian adoption agencies are being shut down. Uh, Christian businesses are being shut down because they can't participate in gay weddings. Now, if the government can figure out some kind of way to allow people of faith to coexist with with people who condone or approve of same-sex marriage, then maybe it's possible for these two things to be be legal. But right now, I, I don't see how it's possible. Right now, there is this this war between religious liberty and sexual liberty. 
And you better choose a side because it, it's going to come after you. Okay, number five. The fifth truth, sex is only for marriage. Sex is only for marriage. This is, this is something that I really want you to see that you may never have seen before in these words of Jesus. He says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Okay? Now, I want you to notice two important phrases in that verse. The first is, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The, the King James Version uses the language of leaving and cleaving. A man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, be joined to his wife. Okay, this is referring to the marriage commitment. The, the husband and wife are reestablishing new priorities. Their family, their parents were their previous priority. Now their spouse is their new priority. They're starting a new family. And so being joined to his wife, that's uh, ma- uh, language concerning marriage. And then the next phrase is the two will become one flesh. And that's the language of sexuality. And I want you to notice the order because it's extremely important. First, the man and wife are joined in marriage. And then the two become one flesh. Sex always in the Bible follows marriage. Anytime sex is put before marriage, it's a sin. It's immoral. It's against God's will. Hebrews 13, 4 says this, Marriage is to be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled, because God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. I want you to notice two words there, the two phrases. The, the phrase sexually immoral, that's the Greek word pornea, where we get our uh, English word pornography, and sexual immorality refers to any sexual activity before uh, marriage or, or any immoral, any sinful uh, sexual behavior. So that's talking about premarital sex. And then adultery is talking about extramarital sex, whenever a married person has sex with someone other than their spouse. And so in this verse, it says God will judge anybody who has sex, any kind of sexual activity outside of the marriage between one man and one woman. And that's how God defines sexual morality. And then number six, one more truth that we find here is that sex is only for a man and his wife, not homosexual relationships. Sex is only for a man and his wife, not homosexual relationships. The only people in the Bible who are allowed to have sex are a husband and wife. He said this in verse 5, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The only one flesh union in the Bible is between a husband and a wife. I want to show you just a few verses before we close about homosexuality. It is condemned in the Old Testament and it's condemned in the New Testament. Look at these verses, Leviticus 18, 22. It says, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a woman. It is an abomination. And the Christian Standard Bible uses the word detestable. That means that homosexuality is an act that is extremely displeasing to God. All right? And then Leviticus 20, 13, a couple of chapters later. It says, if a man sleeps with a man as with a woman, they have both committed a detestable act or an abomination. They must be put to death. Their death is their own fault. Now, this is the civil law. And so in this verse, you have a mixture of both moral and civil law. The moral law is that homosexuality is against God's will. The civil law, which applied just to the nation of Israel, was that the punishment for homosexuality was death. It was a capital crime which shows you how serious of a sin homosexuality is to God. And then Romans 1, 26 through 27, the Apostle Paul is writing. He says, for this reason, God delivered them over. In other words, because they kept rejecting God, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged natural natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men, in the same way, also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. And so this passage describes homosexual activity as disgraceful, as unnatural, and as shameless. Okay, the next one, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Okay, well, who are the unrighteous? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, that's anybody who has 
any kind of sexual activity outside of marriage or before marriage. Idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males. No thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And so here, I want you to notice that homosexuality is defined as an unrighteous behavior. It's placed in a vice list, a list of vices, evil behaviors. It's placed in a list of behaviors like sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery, theft, greed, drunkenness, verbal abuse, and on and on. It's placed right there in that list with those sins. This verse also says that unrepentant homosexuals will go to hell, just like unrepentant adulterers. And it says that the power of God can enable a person struggling with homosexual temptations to repent and to live a holy life. Notice that it says in verse 11, it says, And some of you used to be like this. Homosexuality is not something that's inherent, that a person can't change from. It's just like any sin. We can all be set free by Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11 says, We know, this is the last passage on homosexuality, we know that the law is not meant for a righteous person, but for the lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinful, for the unholy and irreverent, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral and homosexuals, for slave traders, liars, perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which was entrusted to me. And so once again, I want you to see that homosexuality is placed in a vice list alongside a bunch of other sins. Lawlessness, rebellion, ungodliness, sinfulness, unholiness, irreverence, those who kill their parents, murderers, the sexually immoral, slave traders, liars, perjurers, Homosexuality is right there in that, in that list. And it says that homosexuality is contrary to the sound teaching of the gospel. The sound means healthy, wholesome, pure. The sound teaching, and it does not conform to the gospel. There are no homosexual Christians, not practicing unrepentant homosexual Christians. There are some who claim to be, but it's unbiblical, it's unchristian. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to repent of all your sins, including the sin of homosexuality. Dr. Robert Jeffress, who you're going to hear from next week, he said about homosexuality, he said, we cannot condone what God has condemned. We cannot as Christians condone what God has condemned. Don't fall into the trap of trying to be liked by the world and by unbelievers. You say, well, I have a homosexual cousin, a homosexual son or daughter, a homosexual friend Jesus said, if you want to be his follower, you have to love him more than your family. He even said, you cannot be his follower if you don't hate your father and mother, your brother and sister, and your children, and your parents. In other words, what he was saying is that there can be no contest between Jesus and the people in your life. It's Jesus. And if the other people in your life want to love you still and still want to have a relationship with you, great. But it's Jesus. Dr. Albert Moeller said, those churches that affirm, confess, and acknowledge the full authority of the Bible have no choice in this matter. We must speak a word of compassionate truth. And that compassionate truth is this, homosexual acts are expressly and unconditionally forbidden by God through his word, and such acts are an abomination to the Lord by his own declaration. All right? There's no confusion about what the Bible teaches when it comes to homosexuality. So three things real quick. How can we stand firm against sexual liberation, against this sexual revolution movement? Three things. Number one, hold on to the truth of God's word. It doesn't matter what's popular. It doesn't matter how mean people are to you and how, what they say about you. Hold on to the truth of God's word. There's only two genders. Gender is fixed and not fluid. Gender is assigned by God, not chosen by the individual. Marriage is the union of one man and one woman for a lifetime. Sex is only for marriage. Homosexuality is against God's will. Number two, to stand firm, don't believe the lie that to disagree with someone's lifestyle is to fear or hate them. 
Don't believe the lie that to disagree with someone's lifestyle is to fear or hate them. This is what people will try to do. They're going to try to intimidate you into caving in, into compromising on your beliefs. And the way they're going to do it, they're going to say, if you disagree with somebody's lifestyle, then you are a hater. You're a bigot. But that's nonsense. Parents disapprove of their children's behavior all the time. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you don't approve of everything your children do. You disapprove of your children all the time and what they do, that doesn't mean you hate them. If a wife fusses at her husband because he cashed his check and went and blew it at the casino, that doesn't mean she hates him. She just disapproves of his behavior. And so we can hate the sin and love the sinner, and that's what we're called to do. Finally, number three, to stand firm, don't believe the lie that to love someone, you must agree with everything they believe or do. We're called to love, that's for sure. We're called to love one another. We're called to love our enemies. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. But we're not called to love everybody's behavior. And when people criticize our beliefs about homosexuality, they're going to say, you're supposed to be a loving person. You're not supposed to condemn and judge other people. But loving someone doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that they do. Once again, I love my kids, but I don't agree with everything that they do. I love my wife, but I would not agree with her decision to leave me and divorce me. The biblical definition of love, it means meeting someone's needs, not their wants. And it means doing what's best for someone, not necessarily what makes them feel good. What's best for homosexuals and transgenders? What do they need? They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need the truth of God's word. And they may not all like it, They may not find it all pleasant to hear the truth, but that's what they need. And it takes a person of true character and of true love to be able to speak the truth to them in a gentle and compassionate, loving way, longing for them to repent so that they can receive eternal life and receive freedom in Jesus Christ. But that's who we're called to be, called to declare the truth in an age that hates the truth. So may God help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you will help us, Lord, to stand firm. God, we live in an age where people hate the gospel, and they hate your word, and they hate the truth, and they hate us for standing firm on the truth. And Lord, it's it's getting harder and harder to stand firm, and we just pray for your strength. Help us, Lord, not to be arrogant or prideful about the truth, but just to be humble and and to be obedient, and to be loving. And Lord, when it comes to this sexual revolution, help us, Lord, to stay pure, to seek holiness in our lives, to set the example of what a godly marriage, a good marriage is supposed to look like, and a good sex life is supposed to look like, to set the example for uh, what a pure, chaste teenager is supposed to look like, for what it looks like to wait for marriage to have sex. Help us to set the example for the world and show them that God's way is the superior way. And help us, Lord, to speak the truth in love as we encounter people who are far from you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.